The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, the ACNC's webinar for June, which is, as you can see on the screen, about the Australian Charities Report. We'll have a look through um, some of the details of it and, and field some questions. My name is Matt Crichton and I'm from the ACNC's education team and joining me to talk about this fascinating report today is Tim Liu who is from the ACNC's reporting team and had a large hand in much of what became the final report. Hello Tim. Hello everyone. Okay before we do get into the presentation um, itself I'll just run through a few admin Admin things that we um, need to let you know about. First, if you're having trouble with some audio during the webinar, another option you have is to dial into the webinar and you do that using the phone number that you would have received in an email. It would have been in an email that you received upon um, registering for this webinar. So if you can track back that um, email, there's a, an option to, to dial a phone number and then you'll be able to hear the audio over your phone instead of your, inter your computer or whatever device you're using. As we go through, feel free to ask questions. You can use the um, GoToWebinar navigation panel there to ask some questions. We've got a couple of colleagues standing by to ask all the questions that you've got ready to go. And that's Chris and Bree, so they'll be um, typing frantically to answer all your questions. But if you wanted to hold off until the presentation was finished, we do have some time at the end for a quick Q&A session. So if you wanted to see what we have to say first and then ask a question, that's perfectly fine too. We'll try to get around to everyone's questions um, at that part of the, the webinar. Um, also, if you uh, miss out on asking something you, you remember later on that there was something you want to ask about, feel free to send us an email. We're happy to um, to uh, you know, field those questions later on as well. And just on emails, we will we are recording this webinar and it will be published on the ACNC's website. And when that is, we'll send a follow up email to everyone who registered to let you know that it's there and that follow-up email will contain a bunch of links and some other resources that we make reference to in the webinar. So no need to you know, frantically jot down notes, you, you'll receive all of this in a follow-up email later. Okay, let's move on. What we'll cover today, we're going to have a look at the Australian Charities Report. We'll have a look at um, uh, just, just what it is and, and what we um, where it comes from. We'll look at some of the select highlights from this most recent report. We'll go over some of the key statistics and um, we'll just talk about some of the other information about cha Australian charities, Australia's charity sector that we that the um, report uncovered. So about the charities report, we do publish the Australian charities report every year. The first one came out in 2013 and as we um, produce more of them we're uh, providing more data and statistics back to the sector through what we learn in, in the research. It's a comprehensive record of the charity sector and um, it provides some new insights and, and shows the changing nature of, nature of Australia's, Australia's charities. Tim, you did a lot of work on the research here. Can you let people know where the data comes from that produces this um, Australian Charities Report each year? Yeah, so um, each year charities are required to submit an annual information statement to the ACNC and that's what we've used in um, completing this report. So we used actually over 47,000 annual information submissions. Um, obviously there's a cutoff date to do any research so we had to stop at a certain point in time but we analysed the data in uh, February this year. And the name of the report, actually, if we just go back a slide, no, it's not on there, but the name of the report, this most recent one, is called Australian Charities Report 2017, which uh, I suppose initially sounds somewhat dated, but the reason it's called 2017 is, um, and if I'm wrong, Tim, you can jump in and correct me, that this is the data collected from the 2017 annual information statements. Yeah. Okay. So even though it's coming out in 2019 and it is the most recent look at the charity sector, it's named the 2017 one because of the um, annual information statements that were analysed to produce the data. The report itself um, is, a, is a resource to help not only charities but, but donors, governments, researchers and, and even the public better understand Australia's, Australia's charity sector. Um, if you wanted to have a look at previous year's reports too, they are all on the ACNC website. We've got a link down there at the bottom. 
um, it, it's a bit of a long one. We'll include this in the follow-up email so you can um, have a look at that later. But if you were to have a look now, you can go to forward slash tools, topic guides and Australian charities report and you'll find all of them there. Tim, also, it's not just a report in the sense of um, a, a physical uh, you know, PDF that you can download or browse over on the website. There is the, the data that you use to come up with the report is available for people to um, have a look at themselves. Yeah, so what we've uh, produced and we also produced last year is what we call a data cube. So what that contains is um, annual information statement data that you yourself can go in and filter as you wish based off any variable that you want. So you could filter based off state, uh, the main activity, main beneficiary to actually drill down into anything that you're looking for. And as Tim said, we've had this for a couple of years now, so this year is no different. It builds on the work of previous years. And I thought it might be useful now if we just give you a quick look at what this looks like. Um, it, it may be a bit more salient than our um, broader description. So I'll just take you out of the presentation. Let's have a quick look at it. I've got this on the screen at the moment. So the URL here at acnc.gov.au forward slash charity data will bring you to this page and if you just scroll down you can see here this is what uh, Tim was referring to when he said the data cube. It's a little section on this page of the website that contains um, lots of categories and, and stats based on a whole bunch of different fields and, and variable data. So if you wanted to have a play around with this you can. You can have a look at um, stats by location, size and activities, finances. You can even filter all of these major categories um, into smaller um, categories of size, state, urban, regional, as you can see down here on the right hand side. So um, as Tim said, it is free for you to uh, explore, um, go into this part of the website. And as you can see here, I've just clicked on finances as an example, and that brings up some more stats that you can have a look at. And you can even filter some of this down to say you wanted to know just um, what uh, this looks like in Queensland. You can filter the data and, and have a look at the stats there. So um, sometimes the, um, the extent to which you can play around with the data doesn't quite come across in just a, a, an off-the-cuff sentence about the data being available to explore. I think if you have a look at this and you can see what's what's possible and what you can have a look at, it, it um, resonates a little bit more. Yeah. So if you get some time to have a look at that, it really is worth um, worth the effort. And some of you uh, with a keen eye might notice that the number of charities on the data cube is less than the number of charities we analysed in the report. Um, and that's basically because uh, of the ACNC's uh, withholding uh, rules. So if a charity has uh, information withheld uh, from the public register, it won't show in this data cube. Okay, so that explains the number of charities there in the overview being 44,591, whereas the homepage of the ACNC website will say a different number. Yes. And that's the total number of registered charities. Yeah. Okay. Let's just jump back into our presentation. Let's go over some of the details now. Tim, let's uh, start with size. Uh, what did the research find about um, ACNC or charity sizes that, of charities registered with the ACNC? Yeah, so the ACNC has uh, three sizes. Um, so we have small, medium and large charities. So small charities have revenue less than 250,000. Medium have a revenue between 250,000 and less than a million. And large charities have revenue over a million. So what we found is consistent with previous years is that about two thirds of charities are small, um, which isn't surprising. Uh, a lot of charities, as, as you would know, are volunteer based and are simple, small operations for the local community. But within small, because, because that cutoff is at 250,000, there are some organisations that would dream of that sort of funding. <laughs> so small, as the bottom stat here on the, on the screen shows, is broken down even further. Yeah, definitely. So what we've um, done is just break down some of the revenue into even more granular detail. So about a third of charities um, are extra small, uh, which probably won't surprise a lot of you listening there. Um, on the other end, what we found is that there's very small numbers of charities uh, with a lot of revenue. So what we've done in the report is talk about um, extra large charities. So these are charities with revenue over a million dollars. Um, and just 0.4% of charities uh, fit into this criteria. Right, so the, I suppose the, the snapshot is that the over, overwhelming majority of charities registered with ACNC are small, under 250,000, and within that there's quite a significant proportion that are 
extra small and, and only operate on a really, really small amount of money. Definitely. What did the research find about activities? We know that the charity sector is, is very uh, broad and diverse, ca captures a lot of different types of organisations. What did the statement, the annual information statement, show us about the activities in the sector? Yeah, so um, as you can see on the screen, nearly a third of uh, main activities were religious in nature, uh, which may not surprise you all. Um, something that may surprise you is the least common activity reported by charities was in law and legal services. Okay, so the, just touching on the religious one for a moment, that's, that's quite a large um, percentage above the rest. Is there any reason why it would be such a major, uh, it, would, it would, you know, come across with such a major um, percentage of, of activities? It probably won't surprise uh, some of the people listening, but it, this does depend on a charity's purpose. And a lot of charities in Australia um, are organised to um, advance religion. And we know that there's at least 15,000 registered charities that are churches in Australia. So in that context, it's probably not too surprising. Um, as you can see from the second and third, education's uh, the second most common um, main activity. Beneficiaries too comes up in the annual information statements and it gives us an insight into the types of people or groups um, of people that charities are set up to help. What did the research for the 2017 annual information statements show us about beneficiaries? Yeah, so um, probably not surprising that about half, 48% of charities um, selected the general community in Australia as uh, their main beneficiary. What that means is generally it's a charity that doesn't target specific groups. Its services are available to a broad range of people. Oh, okay, so rather than um, say a particular organisation that may be set up for, uh, just an example off the top of my head, for um, you know people that are, have um, significant illnesses or, or um, uh, particular disabilities, the general community in Australia is organisations that, that just have services that anyone can access. Well, you know, uh, providing that they meet certain criteria, but not for a particular class of people. Yeah, definitely. I mean, a, a good example of that would be your local church. They're not going to um, push anyone away. They're open to the general public to, to come and attend their services. Right. And beyond this, there are uh, a number of charities that do stipulate um, specific beneficiaries in their annual information statements. What were the most common um, that we found in the research? Yeah, so 10% uh, said their main beneficiary are uh, children who are aged 6 and 15. Um, it's probably not surprising if you think about uh, registered charities. A lot of them are childcare providers, they're schools, um, they, they target that demographic. Um, there's also on about 3% of charities that select those who are aged as their main beneficiary. And again, that's not too surprising as there's a few aged care um, charities that are registered with the ACNC. I think it's worth mentioning here that um, whilst you're right, it might not be surprising to a lot of people, um, it, it may be surprising to those that don't realise how many of these organisations are actually registered as charities. So we often don't think of a, a childcare provider or a school or a hospital um, as being a charity in the traditional sense, but the nature of their work um, it, it having a charitable purpose and, and it, in many cases them being not-for-profit means that they do classify as a charity. So that may, that may um, be an explanation as to why some of these stats don't match up with some people's, uh, I suppose, traditional view of what, what a charity typically is. Definitely, Matt. International activities, though, is probably something that many people do associate with charities in in the traditional sense, working overseas to help um, people in um, underprivileged areas or, or even war-torn countries is a is a common activity. What did the research find um, from the 2017 Annual Information Statement about operations overseas? Yeah, so about 10% of charities reported that they operate uh, overseas in at least one overseas country. Um, this can range from charities who actually have physical activities overseas to those who are just simply sending money overseas. So um, a, a good example might be a charity that helps to fund some international aid 
versus a charity that has on the ground staff to, to provide that aid. Oh, okay, right. That, I think that's actually an important point, a pretty um, important distinction that this is not restricted to, say, the bigger ones that do have that um, physical presence in a country overseas. It, it can be as remote as just helping to fund something through donations. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, I suppose in that sense, the number 4,567 may be surprising to people in that it often forms the, the, the view of what a, a charity traditionally is, particularly operating overseas. It, it might be surprising that the number is so low. I think a lot of people might expect this number to, to have been a little bit higher. Yeah, I mean, it, it does depend on what you think. But for example, you wouldn't expect an aged care provider or a hospital to operate overseas, but a lot of churches do uh, provide some aid of, of sorts to, to people overseas and that's definitely represented in the uh, statistics there. Of the international activities, we'll just move on now and just have a look at the most common countries that were reported in the 2017 annual information statement. Um, oh, Tim, I'll let you talk through this one. There's, there's probably some surprises and not so much surprises on this slide. Um, I don't think people will be surprised by uh, Philippines, Papua New Guinea, Indonesia. Uh, they might be surprised by India, but definitely surprised uh, with New Zealand. And obviously that's because they're a separate country um, and there are a range of charities that operate across the Tasman in both Australia and New Zealand. So we suspect that's probably the reason why New Zealand's in the top five. Okay, so this reflects what was reported by charities as countries in which they operate. and. When you say operators being uh, fairly broad, so if you are a charity that has um, some collaboration with, say, an office or a branch in New Zealand, that will be listed as operating in New Zealand. But of course, that's a very different form of operation than, say, having um, people on the ground in PNG doing some charity work. Yeah, correct, Matt. Um, I suppose the proximity to Australia is reflected there too, with Philippines, PNG, and Indonesia um, being the, the most common. Um, countries for international operations it, more so than, than places further away. The report also does touch on charity location. Um, what, what did you find in analysing the 2017 annual information statements um, for where charities are based? Yeah, so this is based off the uh, physical address the charities provided to us, their business address in the annual information statement. But similar to previous years, about 70% of charities operate in, in major cities. Um, it is interesting to know that 0.8% operate in very remote areas. So these would be, you know, uh, probably somewhere in WA or Northern Territory with not much infrastructure um, or, you know, support. Would some of these charities um, also have operations in more than one, one location? So even though they, their business address might be um, in a major city, some of the work that they do could be in any of the other categories too, regional or remote or very remote. Oh, def definitely. I mean, um, this is just looking at where the business address is, but not where charities operate within Australia. Oh, okay, right. So in that sense, it's probably not surprising that um, major cities is the dominant one and maybe reflects sort of the population more broadly. Yeah, definitely. I think that's a good summary. We often think of charities as operating with lots of volunteer work, um, maybe less so staff. Um, what did the research find about volunteer numbers for this particular period? Yeah, so this is probably one of the statistics that uh, jumped out at us is, is that our volunteer numbers increased to 3.3 million people uh, in the 2017 annual information statement. Um, a little bit of caution though in that this figure reflects the total volunteer numbers and um, as those listening are aware there's a lot of people that volunteer for multiple charities um, or not-for-profits in Australia. Uh, so the 3.3 million it, it wouldn't be accurate to think that there are 3.3 million individual separate people that volunteer for registered charities. Yeah, uh, that's correct, Matt. There's definitely some overlap there in, in that figure. And I suppose many of these, um, uh, well, 
we know that this number wouldn't necessarily include the volunteer work that goes on in the broader not-for-profit um, uh, sector which for organisations that aren't necessarily registered as charities. No, definitely. I mean, the volunteer numbers when you look at the not-for-profit sector would be a lot bigger, um, I suspect. Okay, so even even with those those cautions, it is it does represent quite a slice of the Australian population broadly, and and suggests there is is a fair bit of bit of um, goodwill towards not for profits and charities in the community. How about staff? Though? This is this is often um, a bit that I suppose could be misunderstood in the in the public consciousness, the idea that charities employ staff, and in many cases, quite a number of staff, even full-time staff to, to undertake charitable work. What did the research find about um, the staff reported in the charity sector? Yeah, so um, staff overall numbers are pretty similar year on year compared to last year. So charities employ uh, 1.26 million staff, about 38% are full-time, 36% part-time, and 26% are casual. Um, it's interesting to note that, as with previous years, about half of charities operate without paid staff. So going back to the um, extra small charities out there, you would expect them to be mostly volunteer-based, um, and the larger ones would obviously be more likely to have full-time employees or any employees at all. So if we were to dig a little bit deeper into these stats, we would probably find that the the lion's share of that 38% sit within the the larger charities, the the ones that are smaller in number, but of course um, account for a much larger percentage of the, the financial pie. Definitely, definitely. I think that's a good summary, Matt. Um, and it's important to note here that um, staff um, are an important part of any charity's operations, particularly, well, it depends on what what the charity is and what it does, but there are many charities that do work that, that really does require um, the pro professionalism of, of a, you know, a paid staff member. If you think about all the hospitals and, and education facilities, and, and we could go on and on about sort of organisations that are registered as charities that obviously couldn't operate on just volunteers alone. They, the charities are entitled to, to um, employ people and, and pay people um, to carry out their work I think that just gets at the, I suppose, common misconception that charities should only um, have volunteers or, or shouldn't be able to employ staff to, to undertake their work. And that does bring us to some of the finances. So the annual information statements that charities submit do ask them to provide some financial information. It differs depending on the size of the charity, but we do uh, receive that financial information and um, we, it gives us a, an insight, a picture of what the financial status of the, the sector is. What did the research find, Tim? Yeah, so we'll just quickly skim through this. There's more detail in the charities report itself, but the good news is that the sector's total revenue increased by 3.3 billion, uh, which is quite significant year on year. And it was the second year that uh, the charity sector reported an increase. And this number, I think, um, will surprise lots of people, uh, particularly if you're new to this to this report and this sort of research, but I think there would be a lot of people that wouldn't have guessed $146 billion as the, as the revenue of the charity sector. It sort of runs contrary to what many people think about um, with charities. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, as you've pointed out, it, it's the big one that earn the big bucks and uh, that's represented in the figures there. You mentioned that it there was an increase in in um, or on the previous year, but here we see a stat that says the expenses, the reported expenses through the annual information statements, um, show a decrease. Yeah, so that's that's a bit interesting in the total expenses for the the charity sector, which includes uh, grants and donations made outside Australia or employee expenses, amongst other expenses, has actually uh, slightly decreased uh, year on year. Um, what that means is that uh, overall charities have made more of a, a net surplus um, than in previous years. And of course, this is this is aggregate data. So while this gives us an insight into the sector as a whole, of course, the the stories of individual charities may differ. And and while the, the sector may um, 
have seen an increase in, in overall income and, and a decrease in expenses leading to potentially this, this surplus. I suppose the story may be different for individual charities and it all depends on, on what um, their individual circumstances are. It doesn't mean that every single charity has made a surplus, of course. It's Definitely just, not that. It's just an aggregate view of the sector as a whole, just to give us an insight into, I suppose, the, the sheer size of the sector, if, if nothing else. Um, this is a breakdown of revenue sources. I, it may be a little bit tricky to see here, but as um, Tim said, the, the report itself is online. You can take a little bit more time to have a look at this graph if you like, and even explore the data as we showed you before. But this does give um, a little bit of an overview of where this money is coming from. What did uh, you find when analysing the statements? Oh, it probably won't surprise people by now, but uh, the larger charities are responsible for more of the sector's overall revenue. So earlier um, in this webinar, I mentioned that uh, if you see the second uh, bottom row, uh, extra large charities only account for 0.4% of Australia's registered charities. Yet if you look at their revenue figure, that's nearly half of the sector's uh, revenue. So it does show how, I guess, top heavy the, the big players are in the charity sector. Um, as you, it probably won't surprise anyone, government grants uh, often account for a larger proportion for larger charities, um, and that's the dark blue colour there. And donations are relatively uh, minor compared to that, but for the extra small charities, you can see that uh, donations are a bigger portion of their revenue compared to others. Yeah, right. It's funny because extra small and small, I mean, this is fairly impre imprecise in the form that it's the, the visual form that it takes here but you can see that the extra small and small and for that matter medium reliance on donations and bequests is not too far removed from that um well it's actually probably larger for that than than the extra large yeah. so it shows that that they're really much more heavily reliant on donations and bequests than some of the extra large charities are which um yeah take a lot of their uh, revenue from government grants and, and even goods and services. Yeah, definitely. And um, if we have a look at uh, some of these sources in more detail, we found, or oh, Tim, I'll let you explain it. What, what did we um, uh, find with the government grants? Yeah, so a, a good example of um, how the sector is diverse is that extra large charities, 92% uh, of them received government grants or revenue from government. In comparison, only 14% of extra small charities receive this. So if you think about it, it probably isn't surprising. So you think the extra large charities would be, for example, large hospitals, large universities, large schools. They, they definitely would receive money from government. But the extra small, more volunteer-driven ones are probably unlikely to apply for government grants or receive any revenue from government. And I suppose if you are, if you have any familiarity with work in a, in a charity that sits on the extra small end of the scale, this will sound very familiar to you. Yeah, I suspect so. And I think this, um, there's a fair bit of competition for minimal funds available at that end of the end of the spectrum. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, and I think it is worth just reiterating that point that Tim just made, because um, it, it does frame this stat um, in a little bit more context, I suppose, is that uh, registered charities do cover a wide range of organisations, right up to hospitals, universities, schools, and, and the ones that you would think of um, as maybe not ordinarily being charities in the traditional sense, but certainly having um, much more funds than some of the other smaller organisations. Um, and this is interesting too, just some other sources that we found um, which may be surprised people, particularly the first one, because I think many people think of charities um, being synonymous with donations and all their money coming from donations from, from the public, but that's not the case. No, only two thirds of uh, charities receive uh, revenue from donations or bequests. Um, so yeah, it does sort of represent, I guess, a bit of a change in perception. Um, what is interesting is that in the 2017 annual information statement, uh, we started collecting uh, uh, new financial elements. So it was revenue from goods and services and revenue from investments. So we found roughly about half of charities receive revenue from goods or services um, and about another half receive revenue from investments. 
when we'll just um, just touch on this for a moment, because um, I think goods and services is while well, the first one, donations bequests, is is clear. Many people associate that with charities. The next two a little bit unclear, I suppose. Not many people would associate charities with um, goods and services. What what typically what what do we mean when we say goods and services? Yeah, I mean you're right, man. It's probably a bit of a, a perception issue. But when we talk about goods or services, we're looking at, for example, op shops. Um, schools, they provide services to kids, which right. is essentially education. Um, hospitals provide services to those in need. Uh, so that's what we're referring to when we talk about goods or services. Okay, right. Um, and well, then how about investments? That's something that's a word that we more often associate in the business context. And what, what do we, what are the sort of typical investments that a charity might, might um, have? Yeah, definitely. I mean, um, some typical examples might be a charity that invests in shares. The reason it does that is to receive dividends so that it can, you know, fund more of its services. Um, a more common one is probably bank interest. A lot of charities have money in the bank. They might have term deposits. Um, and that's what we refer to when we talk about revenue from investments. Okay. That does bring us to the end of the... Um the main presentation. We, as I said at the beginning, we do have some time for uh, questions and answers, and we have had a few questions come through as we've gone along, so I thought it was worth taking the time to answer these um, publicly, because I think um, some people uh, will get some something out of the questions and the answers. Uh, we did have someone ask a question touching on one of the very early points you made, Tim, about there being 47,000 approximately 47,000 annual information statements um, analysed for this data, but there are 54,000 registered charities, um, or maybe 55, but it's up to about 57,000 I think now. The point being, why aren't all the charities annual information statements um, analysed for this data? Yeah, so um, the, even though there's about 57,000 registered charities at the moment, about only 50, 51,000 are actually required to submit the 2017 annual information statement. So we actually had a pretty good run. I mean, if you haven't logged your annual information statement and you're a charity, please submit your 2017 one. Um, but it's a pretty good representation of where the sector's at. So it's a quite a, a large percentage, so 47,000 of 51,000 yeah. that were required to submit yeah. were analysed for the uh, for the report. Definitely, it's above 90% and it's it's pretty good to represent the sector's diversity. Um, and, and that's largely due to the cut-off date. So at some point you have to draw a line and say, right, we need to start analysing the data now. So some are going to be late, some yeah. are not unsubmitted. So they're the ones that probably have fallen off um, in analysing the data. Definitely. Um, we had a we had a question um, about um, pre, that in previous sorry so, uh, a keen a keen observer has noticed that in previous reports there was estimated data, um, but not in this not in this report. Can you explain what that means? So uh, this report doesn't use estimated data in the way that previous reports did. Yeah. So in in previous charity reports, in particular the 2016 one, um, there was what we refer to as an estimation of proxy data. So where an annual information statement wasn't submitted, um, our researchers uh, estimated what they perceived the uh, revenue to be for that charity and a few other things. So we, we've taken the approach to just report um, based on what charities have submitted to us. Um, and as I said, 47,000 is um, pretty high. Um, and because our report was published uh, more recently than, than um, or later than previous reports, we were able to use more annual information statements and not really need to estimate in that sense. Okay, so, so there's no reliance on um, extrapolation and, and, and trends. To no, no, okay. no. Um, a question on, about DGRs. Um, I suppose for those who aren't familiar, DGR is a, is a common uh, initialism which stands for deductible gift recipient. It's a particular tax concession that some charities have which allows them to, um, well, allows donors to claim back the donation they make to the charity on their own personal income tax. Um, 
So Tim, uh, the question is about um, all charities having DGR and um, I, I suppose the, the point about donations and bequests is relevant here. So do all charities have DGR status and does that affect um, the, the donations and bequest stats? Yeah, so um, I, all charities would love to have DGR status, um, but unfortunately you need to meet certain criteria um, and only about 39% of charities have that status. Uh, so that's pretty consistent with previous years. Uh, it's not surprising. Um, a lot of uh, religious charities won't have that DGR status um, and that probably accounts for sort of why it's 39%. Um, but it is uh, something that uh, we are aware that charities are interested in. Um, and so, yeah, it's pretty similar to previous years. So this, um, the relevance of this, um, I suppose, is is touching on another maybe a, a broader misconception is that any donation to any organisation registered as a charity is automatically um, available to you to claim back on your own personal income tax. That, that's not the case and it's the stats and the reports show that in fact only 39% of charities do offer that um, uh, ability for you to claim your donation back. Yeah. Less than half. Definitely, yeah, yeah. That's, that's a good point, Matt. Um, Having a look at just a couple other questions that are coming through now. Um, oh, there's one about the report itself, noting that it's it's a little bit slimmer this year. Does that uh, reflect a change in the research approach and research data or not? Um, I suppose I can answer this. No, the, the research is the same and the data cube that we um, showed you before on the website is again the same and it's got updated data. In fact, th there's more um, included, but um, being there 47,000 uh, uh, annual information statements analyzed this time. The slimmer physical report is just um, a decision to uh, make that a little bit more accessible and readable for people if they had to print off the report or get a hold of the physical report. Whereas in previous years, it that physical report also included much of the tables and the stats that are uh, in the data cube online. So, so this year we thought rather than um, taking up much of the physical printed report with many of the, the, the tables and, and stats that you can find online, we'd um, allow the physical report to be one that people can uh, read and browse through and, and, and take information through um, an accessible um, format rather than having to um, go through too many stats and they can use the online um, data cube to to look at the stats themselves. So we thought it was a a better way to present the the physical report this year. So the short answer to that is um, it, it, it's slimmer for cosmetic reasons really that the data itself is is still there and still available to have a look at. Okay, it looks as though we've probably covered most of the questions here. Oh, one last one. Um, someone's asked about the 2019 annual information statement. Um, um, which is going to be available very soon. So I suppose we could jump back to 2018 too. Um, they're asking us if there's anything different that we can expect in what charities have to report, which the knock on effect of that would be that there'll be different stats in the next few reports. Tim, have you got any insights there? Yeah, so the 2019 annual information shouldn't say will be available very soon. Um, there's not many changes to it. The only thing that we're um, asking charities is if they've got a website to provide that to us. Um, it's an optional field. So what we're just trying to do is um, improve the number of charities with their website on our register um, and help the sector get out there. So. It's pretty much um, the same as 2018, which will probably be a relief to many charities submitting it. And just on 2018, so we've just released the early this year, the Australian Charities Report 2017, which is the report reporting on the 2017 annual information statement. The report for the 2018 annual information statement is due, well, we're doing that again, and that will be due in the coming months or a bit longer. Yeah, we're, we're penciling in uh, by the end of March at the latest, uh, maybe fe February or March, but that's when we uh, want to publish the reports each year and, and get that data back out there to the sector. 
Okay, so we look forward to the the next update, um, the two, the Australian Charities Report 2018. Mm. Okay, um, I think that will bring us to the end of today's webinar. As I said at the beginning, if you've got some questions, send them through now. We've still got Chris and Bree answering your questions via text um, as we speak. Otherwise, if you want to send us an email later, you can do so. For more information about the Charities Report, you can have a look at it as we showed you there. I'm jumping to the middle point here on the screen. Explore the interactive data at acnc.gov.au forward slash charity data. You can see the, the report itself at acnc.gov.au forward slash charity report. And the top point here on the screen is um, the place that we um, publish data sets, um, not, not restricted to just the, the charities report data sets. It's, um, the data that is uh, provided by charities and published on the charity register is available for download at um, data.gov.au. Yeah, so there's basically just uh, numerous data sets with an Excel spreadsheet and that Excel spreadsheet will contain all of the data. So for example, there's an Excel spreadsheet for all 2017 annual information statements um, that you can go in and manipulate on Excel as you see fit. So there's all the data there for you to explore. Um, and just more broadly, if you want to stay in touch with us, have a look at our commissioners column and email updates on the website, as well as web guidance on various topics, video content, podcasts, and whatnot. For all our webinars, go to acnc.gov.au forward slash webinars. And any questions um, about uh, what this topic or any other questions about you know, charity issues or charity eligibility and whatnot, you can send an email to advice at acnc.gov. .au, and we're pretty active on social media. Okay, thank you for attending. If you've got any feedback on the webinar specifically, send us an email to education at acnc.gov.au. We love hearing your feedback on the webinars and any of the uh, web content or educational materials. It's a great way for us to improve. And on that point, um, when you finish the webinar here, there'll be a very, very short survey. I think it's only uh, three questions. It might take you 20 seconds, maybe 30 seconds. Um, about the webinar itself. So if you could take the time to fill that in, we'd greatly appreciate it. It helps us uh, do things better. That's it for today. Thank you for attending. Thank you, Tim. Thanks everyone for attending and I hope you found this useful. Go have a look at the data. It's, it's really good fun actually. You get in there and you can have a look at some um, really obscure little stats of the charity sector and you can waste a lot of time there. Not waste, that's the wrong verb. So we, you can spend a lot of time there wisely. Um, but do check it out, it, it's worthwhile. And thanks to Chris and Bree who've been answering the questions as we've gone along. We look forward to your attendance at our next webinar, which will be next month. Thanks everyone. Bye.